Welcome to the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast, the place for first-gen students of color to prepare for grad school. This is Dr. Yvette Martinez Bu, and I will be serving as your Femme Tour, providing you with tips and tricks and everything else you need to know to get into and successfully navigate grad school. For over 10 years, I've been helping first-gen students of color get into top grad programs in their field, and I'm really excited to support you on your academic journey too. All right, welcome everyone. We have another podcast episode, another guest. I'm excited today because I have someone here joining us uh, to talk about what it's like being a Chicana PhD lecturer on the margins, but with a whole heart. And our guest is Dr. Diane Nevarez. And now I'm like, I forgot to ask you if that if I'm pronouncing your last name right. Because Perfect. <laughs> Nevarez, okay. Because <laughs> I keep on, I, 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 earlier today I was like, is it Nevarez or Nevarez? And then I was like, no, it's Nevarez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Nevarez. I told myself, let me ask her before we record. Oh, so no. Know. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and um, start with your bio. So. Dr. Diane Nevarez's ancestors are Mixtec from Oaxaca and Puebla, Mexico. She was born and raised in Southern California where her mom encouraged her to use her voice even when it got her in trouble. Dr. Diane recently uprooted her family and is raising two young children, Quetzali y Saul in the Central Valley where her partner Arturo is a tenure line professor at CSU Stanislaus. Thanks to student activists who came before her, she had the opportunity to receive formal schooling at CSU Long Beach and USC. Ooh. <laughs> My reaction, that's the Bruin yeah. in me. <laughs> Sorry. No. I, sometimes I'm too transparent. Okay, welcome to the podcast, <laughs> Diane. Thank you. Doctora Diane. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here. I appreciate you and everything you've been doing. Yeah. So I'm really happy for you to come in and, and to come on the show and, and to chat a little bit more about your experience being a PhD lecturer. I know that kind of I mentioned your article on the Times where you talked about your experience um, with that. And I I would love just for the listeners to kind of hear more about you. So if you could just Say a little bit more about your background, backstory, your you. educational trajectory. Yeah, I mean, I've been reflecting on it so much. And actually that piece in the LA Times came out of a tearful typing session where I just was letting it out and writing about what I went through um, and my dreams and my goals. It's very emotional for me. So even now I feel some tears kind of welling up. But um, I have to say that such a big part of it is that I, I, I'm still kind of mourning. I don't know if I'm there yet, but maybe mourning the loss of the dream I had and trying to envision a different dream for myself or a different future. And I know you've kind of been talking about that. And that's yes. so important that you've been, you know, addressing that, that there are other possibilities for us. And, and even seeing what you and like Chicana Mother work, how you have created different spaces um, which I'm still at a place where I'm, a, I'm not even talking about my background. I just realized you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but <laughs> this no. is important though. Like I, I really appreciate you being so um, honest about the difficulties and the challenges of um, sometimes being a little bit disillusioned. Um, you know, I, I, I think I had said like, Sometimes it feels like there's there can be a failed promise with mm -hmm. academia, like you're trained to do a certain thing and then it doesn't happen. And that is a grieving process. I've been mm -hmm. dealing with the grieving process myself too. And But also, I think there's also a lot of possibilities and a lot of hope. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> so I know we went off on, I but I, 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 yeah, it's, I would, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to so, tell you. I'm, I'm like, Other than I would love to hear just a little bit more about like how you got to where you yeah. are today. Thank so, you. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think it always actually goes back to my mom um, and, and her journey and her stories and her being, to me, she would have been an amazing Chicana professor 
but you know she didn't have the opportunities and she didn't get to go to college and speaking of USC while she was in her 20s she was working at USC and raising you know my brother she was a really young mom she was a teenage mom and so um, that's so connected to me because she was at USC with among college students and grad and PhD students and she was working though she wasn't able to live that life they had and just study and learn and like she admired it so much and she you know what the way she talks about it now like so like romanticized and so beautiful like oh yeah. to be a college student right and I feel like she always internalized it like feeling like she just wasn't smart enough like it was something she did wrong mm -hmm. um so getting into USC for me I'm gonna get through this it was um like getting it back like taking it back right yeah and um and and finally a lot you know, of us have there. those stories right yeah, yeah 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 so um so that's what that was but um so yes my mom's story really is what is what propelled me and like just not even just connect my mom but connecting it to like all the chicanitas and chicanitos who were pushed out along the way seeing that chicano pipeline image you know and seeing like only you know what 0.5 of us or something like not even a whole person gets into um into phd programs and so feeling like i wanted to take up that fight and you know that's what, what brought me into a phd program was like the coraje rooted in love that it wasn't that I love studying. Like I it wasn't always a great student. <laughs> yeah. I was not an honor student. Um, it was more just that passion and that drive to like, why are we getting pushed out? Like, that's not right. We have yeah. to do something about this. We have to bring others in. No, I'm gonna, if I can do it, I, I'm gonna get in, right? And so that's what really drove me and, you know, to make change and like this love for our comunidad. But um, I guess what I was so focused on was getting in and I didn't really know anything beyond that. It was like saying, I'm gonna go to the moon. Like, I'm gonna get a PhD, I'm going to the moon. Like, I don't know what that means or how to be an astronaut, but you know, um, so that was it. And so I, that's why when I see like going through your program and looking at what you, like how you, you femtor and I'm like, wow, like the younger me could have really used this, this type of support because I had no idea. And so even, even when I was in the program, then it was like surviving each day. Yeah. I'm just got to survive each day. And I couldn't even envision graduating because it was, yeah, it was very traumatic. Um, and so to try to get a job, like what, I'm just trying to make it through each day, right? Yeah. You know, um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I, decided to just start the podcast was at my frustration um, with the lack of information and just feeling like, why didn't anybody tell me? Why didn't anybody warn me? Why, like, why did I have to get to this point and come this far only to realize that the grass wasn't always greener? Um, and I, and I understand too, that sometimes, you know, from my listeners, they might not be ready to hear some of these things right? because I have put out episodes that are diff more difficult topics like the, the one I, I put out um on um you know you're being told a lie and thinking about career yeah. options outside of um academia mm -hmm. and then I had another one with another guest who talked about what it was like for her to retire from student affairs and take mm -hmm. a, a career break altogether and I know you know there's a lot of folks that are contemplating debating and it's just interesting to, to on the back end from like my analytics or the statistics and stuff, seeing what posts get the most likes and what posts get mm -hmm. the least likes, but the most impressions, like a lot of people are like listening to these things, but not liking. And I think that it's, it's just, it's hard, even like the work. I know you, you know, about me and my work through Chicana mother work too. I have, mm -hmm. you know, one of my friends and colegas, you know, she recently shared one of our articles on the experiences of being Chicana mothers in academia. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we share our testimonials and they're, they're difficult, you know, like you said, there's trauma mm -hmm. and the students just like not knowing how to react or not knowing mm -hmm. how to respond because it's that thing of, I was that student too, you get to college and it's this dream. Yes. And then you're like, now what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get to call uh, to grad school, it's this dream. Now, yeah. and then you finish your PhD and there's that post-graduation blues and you're like, now what? And the next thing is, and it's always just this rat, almost as a rat race of like, yeah. you never really get to like 
look back and reflect and take time. And so I think it's really um, meaningful for you to be here. And hopefully if you're comfortable to tell us kind of like where you are in your journey, because um, not everybody got to read the article that you wrote and maybe you can kind of, you know, refresh us a little bit on what you shared there. And then if you're comfortable, like let us know kind of what you're up to now, you know? Sure, perfect, thanks. So um, my article was about um, I'm teaching. So as, I, as soon as I graduated my PhD program, I was grateful to at least get something. Um, you know, I had a new baby and I, I got a job teaching at UC Irvine. So there, there's one swinging right there. Like what I'm teaching at a UC, I've never even been here. Um, the only time I was on campus was I was a student athlete in college. And so I would run on the track, right? That's the only time I would visit these different universities. So to actually be in the classroom was incredible. Um, but, you know, as soon as, so I taught that first, I taught in the master's in teaching program. And as soon as I taught, I taught that first quarter and then they didn't hire me again after that. And that was like, that was hard, right? Because I thought I did so well. And, you know, I, I, oh my God, the, the heart we put into our work, like you can't even, you can't even, you know, quantify it. But um, I got a couple of bad reviews from some white students and um, and I encouraged BIPOC students to create their own critical community because that's how we survive these spaces. I mean, that's one thing I learned, right? We create our comunidad and that's what brings us through. And so they did, they created a space and they were reading articles together and like doing great things. But um, the program, yeah, said I was divisive. So, I mean, I'm putting it all out there. So I, so they didn't hire me back, but um, actually a couple quarters later, thank goodness, the undergraduate program picked me up. And so I was teaching in the undergraduate program, but that's how it is, right? Like you're there and like, do you have classes the next quarter? Who knows? Um, did I have health insurance? I did not. Um, I was on government assistance and that's how I was able to even get health insurance for my, my child. I had one child at the time. Um, and that, like what you had said in the last, in the podcast where you addressed this, I was taking notes about how, you know, you're living with our parents. Yes. Who can take us in? Right. So I was teaching these graduate classes or undergraduate classes and, you know, we can't afford rent anywhere. You have to make two, three times the rent in order to live somewhere like that. And I was just saying that, like, I didn't know your situation, but I yes. was imagining myself in that yes. role, in that position. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so my partner was in a PhD program also at UC Riverside. And here I was with my PhD. And I'm, I mean, sometimes we could just laugh at it. Like we have all these degrees and like, we can't even afford to live anywhere. Like what, like, how did we, like you said, this dream, right? You think it's just, you get the degrees and then you get a house and then it just, ma you know, magically happens. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was I, I, teaching at UC Irvine. And what was amazing, though, was I really I did build a, like I built something there. Mm -hmm. And so then I they had me teach the huge diversity course, which no one else wanted to teach. And I loved it. I mean, it was it became my jam. Like, I just loved it so much. I mean, I brought students in from like our international students, students from other fields, like we're all about education now. And so it was great until I um I mean, I ended up getting an award for teaching. And so that was a weird moment because it was like, thank you so much for this award for teaching, but will I have a job next quarter? Mm. And that's the space you're in where it's like, it's you're filled with love and joy and like, oh my God, to have these amazing, amazing students who inspire you every day and their stories. Oh, mm -hmm. it, nothing is more, I can't think of anything more rewarding. I'm just like, this is heaven right here, mm -hmm. except I don't have health insurance. And I have to pay for parking when I come on campus and I don't have an office for us to talk and, and students crying to me after class and we're in the parking lot talking. And they want to do research with me and they're first generation students and I love them and I want to give them the word, you know, support them as much as I can. And then I know I feel like a failure because I don't do research. I don't have a research grants. I'm not in those meetings. I'm not a tenured faculty. So that's where I start to feel like I failed them. Or did the system fail you, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. And the students right. too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I have to keep trying to remind myself that that's how it's set up. I mean, when we see the data, right, the median income for lectures is nineteen to $20,000. Many of us, yes, are, don't have health insurance and, you know, we're the working poor. And it's like, 
but we're there in the classrooms representing the university and the mission of diversity and, you know, um, trying to, you know, lift each other up and hold each other up. And at the same time, like, do I tell my students that I don't have a job next quarter? Like, do I tell them that I feel like I failed? And then when they ask me about applying to a PhD program, I, I don't, I want to support them. Yeah, that's a big one. Actually, you talking about, you know, when students ask you if they should apply to a PhD program, I never like to say yes and or no, um, because I think it's a very kind of individual and personal decision and it, their circumstances vary widely and that will impact their decision. But mm -hmm. I don't want to just say, yes, you should like, you know, let's like improve that pipeline and this and this and that, mm -hmm. because now I have that perspective of before I would get angry and think, no, I'm going to be one of the few. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now I think, well, I was one of the few that got the PhD, but I was one of many that got pushed out. So yes. that's why I didn't go the tenure track route. I tried to go the alternative academic, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it route. Mm -hmm. Even that was, mm -hmm. that's the thing is like, you know, it's hard enough as a, as an adjunct professor. Um, and then it's, it's sad that even if, when you have job, uh, a, a quote unquote, jo good job with benefits with the, you know, decent salary, or when you get that tenure track job, or you get tenure, I'm still hearing from folks saying that right. it's still too much, you know, mm. it's still, um, because there's so few folks, um, who, who there's so few tenure lines, so few folks mm -hmm. who are able to get those jobs that those few that do get it are overextended right. and then for the staff end there's a huge problem with um, staff shortages in, in universities nationwide because people are leaving yeah. I'm one of them I'm one of the people mm -hmm. that left and uh, I know I had said I was like I don't want this episode to just be negative I want it yeah. to be positive because you know, you did share that. That's a thing when people ask me also like, oh, how can you talk about all the negative things and then still um, support people as they navigate grad school? And for me, it's always like, I will never regret getting my PhD. I will never regret it. And I will never regret the relationship that I built when I taught, mentored, femtored, advised, you know, all the students. And that's what I hear from you. I hear this mm -hmm. strong sense of passion and joy in working oh, with amazing. the students yeah <laughs> and oh, and brain. and for in like in your situation I don't know you that well but I feel like what I want from you is for you to be able to think about what are the things about academia about getting your PhD about your job as a lecturer what are the the things that you really really enjoyed and how can you replicate that in a different setting so for me the way that I have chosen to do it is replicating it by going this entrepreneurial route, which mm -hmm. has been very uncomfortable and I'm still learning and I'm still mm -hmm. in the middle of it. I'm still trying to figure it out, but that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I've got a friend trying to go the creative writing route. I've got friends who, you know, are still adjuncting, but then have their side hustles. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like figuring out, you know, yeah. what are the things that work for me and how can I replicate it in a, in a setting that is kind of you know, that works for, for you. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And so, well, actually I am, I'm going to try one more time. I'm going to, because I, I didn't have any publications. Um, so I, my CV was wacky. So now I'm going to actually try to, um, to apply one more time and see how it goes. And if not, yeah, I, I have a teaching credential to teach high school. So like, that's an option. So I just, I'm trying to think about my options. Currently I'm, I'm a lecturer at Cal State Stanislaus. Um, just trying to get classes, but yeah. The one thing that I also, that you mentioned in your bio that I was hoping you could share a little bit more about is the fact that you are a Chicana mother scholar. You're a mom, you yeah. have two kids. Like that's a big part of your identity aside from being Huge. you know, a lecturer, aside from um, being an incredible teacher. Um, you've got these two, you know, Probably, probably beautiful kids. <laughs> I haven't seen them. <laughs> and so um, would you care to share more about how that kind of has impacted your academic journey too? I and mean, you know, with becoming a mom, because that was huge for me. I can imagine it's probably a big factor influencing your academic 
trajectory? Oh, for sure. I mean, from the very beginning, when being pregnant as a PhD student, um, and just before I before even deciding to be a mother, I had I had already had it said that I wasn't going to ever be a mom because I just received the messages that it, you can't do that in academia. And um, when I started to realize that academia was, um, you know, we, I can't, I can't just, you know, I had to resist that that narrative, and I had to, I, it could be a beautiful thing to be a mom, so I had to let go of that. And yes, I mean, I had my first, my daughter Kitsali when I was a PhD student, um, and that was one I would say good thing was I had time to raise her to be with her. I've nursed her for three years. Um, wow, so yeah. <laughs> that was a huge thing in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, um, so I was there, you know, with her. And so I think, yeah, that was a beautiful part of it that I was able to be there with her. I've been there with my children. I have raised them. So, I mean, partly I couldn't afford childcare. Um, and so that makes it challenging because how am I going to publish if I don't have childcare, right? And I'm just exhausted at the end of the day from mothering. So, um, yeah, but, but at the same time, I was able to be there with my children. You, um, describing, you know, that time that no one ever can, can give you back. It's that time that you were able to spend with your children that is priceless. Um, you're reminding me of the silver linings. There's always a silver lining in any kind of circumstance and, situ yeah. circumstance and situation. And clearly there, there's also a silver lining for you in continuing to um, do this work in academia. I mean, you're going to give it a try another mm -hmm. time. And so I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about, you know, perhaps, you know, what are some of the other silver linings that you find in, in your journey in, um, kind of your hopes and dreams for your future within or perhaps outside of academia or mm -hmm. possibly, you know, silver linings or kind of what advice you would give to yeah, thanks. someone. <laughs> Cause I'm like, you, you said it earlier, you know, if, if I had had this before this mm -hmm. information, you know, I think some things might've worked out a little bit differently too. Yeah. Let me write this down. So I stay on task yeah. here. <laughs> it's like silver linings or yeah. advice for, yeah. for, you know, young oh, I think scholar. One, one of my big pieces, pieces of advice was I didn't ever want to bother anyone. And like, I'm still kind of like that. So when people talk about asking for help, you know, that has always been really hard. Um, so asking for help and asking students who are in programs and asking professors and getting to know the programs, because for me, it was like, I'm going to go into whatever program accepts me. And then someone else reframed it as like, no, you're accepting the program. You're choosing the program. And at what? Like, how is that? that? No, but right. So I, I never thought that way. Um, and, and I think what was really what I've seen that is so important is finding an advisor who's going to support you. Again, I had no idea what an advisor even was to even know to find an advisor who's going to support you. But I just see such big differences for like my partner was pushed out of one program and then he tried again and he had a totally different experience with an advisor who was a femtor who wrote and published with him, who was really trying to get him that job after set him up, you know, totally. And so it makes me feel like hopeful. There are people like that who really do want to guide us through it. And who really can, right? who really can help us get through. Whereas, you know, somewhere like at USC in my program, um, it was, yeah, I mean, if you're not in there fighting, not fighting, but like, if I think I already said this, if you're not like, you know, John, whose dad already published with him because he has a PhD, then sorry, like we don't have, we're not here to just guide and mentor you, like too bad, you got, you gotta go. Um, so that is just totally so cutthroat, so different. And I just, I had no idea. So I guess that's my advice. It's like, there is hope because there are still beautiful, wonderful people in academia who are authentically there to care and to support. You, you know, even though I, I'm no longer in academia, um, my feed, like my social media, I am friends with a lot of academics and a lot of fierce, you know, Chicana, women of color, academics, mother, scholar, academics, like, and I'm reminded, I'm like, if they're still doing this work, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that there's a lot of really good people out there, including actually my former supervisor, as I was on my way out of my job, 
I realized, wow, because I, I had a very toxic advisor in grad school. I had a really good undergrad mentor. And then in, in grad school, very toxic, just not, not a good experience. But mm -hmm. having um, a supervisor who was like a mentor to me who would advocate for me and would say my name, you know, in places where I wasn't, um, mm -hmm. that was really meaningful to me. So it just reminds me that there's actually good people out there systemically there are a lot of issues with academia and it's mm -hmm. important to be aware of them and aware mm -hmm. of them early on and plan you know plan accordingly but um i i can see why why folks stay you know there yeah. there's there's that it's 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 that community factor yeah. it's the factor of having that support um that sometimes it's not as easy to find because i i found myself a little lost when i left academia the first time i graduated in 2016 so the first time i i left was when i decided not to do the tenure track and i felt lost because i was like wait where are my mentors mm -hmm. <laughs> are there no mentors in like the yeah. real world you know that yeah. non academic world <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah exactly and then also you had talked about sharing the silver lining. And for me, it's like, yes, having this PhD gives us access to different spaces. I mean, I having the opportunity to even publish something in the LA Times and have my story shared is because of my degree and my experiences, right? Things that like my parents, they might have suffered and gone through, you know, and the, the hard work they did and the hard labor they did. And like no one was listening to them, right? Their stories weren't shared. Their stories weren't valued or uplifted. Um, and so, yeah, it definitely gives us access and, and in a different way. And I, you know, you try to use it in, in good ways, if, right? What, whatever ways that you can. And I mean, I guess the last thing is just, again, to reiterate the time I've had with my students is just like my cup is overflowing. Like having in these classroom experiences, learning with them. Oh my God. Like it just fills me with just so much love and so much joy that I just feel I would be in the classroom and just be like, I can die happy. Like that's it. Like this is just too good. Right. And yes, so there's all this other stuff. But yes, you know, not having a job and like I would like to have a house, right? All that good stuff. But which you, we all deserve. you deserve. You deserve, we deserve it. I think <laughs> you deserve to have a house you someday. To have amazing students and a you know a good paying job and benefits. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's true. It's true. It's true. But but it has been beautiful, and I've been super grateful. You know, the other thing that um, you're talking about your students is that's not going to go anywhere. You know, if, if, you, if you stay, if you leave, I found myself, I continue to be in touch with my former students and they still send me messages, whether it's on email, social media, sometimes I'll have check-in meetings with them. And it's just so, it continues to be fulfilling when I have days when I feel down and um, I know that I have a meeting coming up with someone you know, instantly I feel better just by connecting with them. So that's the power. That's the power of, of, you know, making connections and building relationships and having a community in academia. So I can't stress that enough mm -hmm. when folks say like, how did you get through it? It's like building community. It's yes. like creating the spaces that aren't there and, exactly. and getting through it together. Cause you don't, exactly. you can't do it alone. Yeah. Mm -mm. Exactly. Well, um, any last thoughts? I think this is a good time to get ready to like wrap up about, you know, anything about your experience being a lecturer, what you wish you knew um, with regard to that. And um, yeah, just uh, any, any last thoughts? And if not, then um, how can others reach you? Okay, well, I guess my last thoughts is just uh, wonderful to have seen that this week, you know, our union, I, I've been so grateful for our union. Our oh my goodness, fighting, yes. right? <laughs> How did I no. forget? I saw that too, that so yeah. the, the strike is no longer happening because UC agreed to uh, meeting kind of what was asked, right? It was Yes, so parental leave for four weeks. Um, fair Which is not a lot to ask for. I yeah. know, I know, but yeah, huge <laughs> for us. Good. And then, right, and then fair compensation for workload and then a raise and like more stability. Um, because well, I was a pre six lecturer, so I wasn't there for six years, so I didn't have that stuff. I mean, that I was mean? like, yeah, Can you explain that? yeah, pre six lecture. I think, I mean, and I'm still like learning everything, I was still figuring it out. But, um, uh, be it, after your six, after you're teaching for six years, you there's more stability. Let's see, oh, I still don't even know, right? Um, and more, yeah, so but be before that, it's where it's very, you're very, um, 
uh, I'm not finding the words right now, precarious, right? Yeah, yeah. And precarious. from one quarter to the next, it's like too bad. Um, so that's where so I after the six years, that's when people start to get security of employment. Try to get a bit more stability, yeah. Um, and again, like I said, I'm still trying to figure out every all of that, but uh, so so more stability and more. It, it, I just it's just real, such a huge victory because they've been fighting for it for two years, and really for them to say this is the, the best contract they've had for UC lectures ever. So I just feel like there is hope, and there's always people fighting, and like I love my, having my union, having their support was wonderful you know because i as a lecturer it's very isolating yeah. i didn't know anybody any other professors and so going to the meetings and finding other lectures oh my god it was just wonderful such a great community that i was so grateful that's amazing and um, you know that's the reason why you're, we're here even in your bio you said thanks to student activists i was able to get my education and you yes. know it's without that, without the movement, without us uh, participating, without us um, voicing, you know, our needs, like this wouldn't have happened. So I'm glad that there's at least that. So again, yeah. you know, it's an indicator of, of there's hope and whether yeah. you want to do the work inside academia, outside academia, it's, um, you know, things are possible with, with enough momentum and with enough support. Yeah, so. we're always there fighting and doing great things. All right. Well, it was really nice to have you on the podcast. If anybody um, heard uh, this episode and just resonated with what you said, maybe wanted to reach out and be in touch. Um, is there a way that they can reach you? Yeah. So let's see. My Instagram is, I think it's doctora underscore Nevarez. Um, and that's a good place. Or also my, uh, oh, I don't even know my email. I, it's my Stan State email here at Cal State Stanislaus. You can like me, look me up. <laughs> it's fine. IG is fine. The other thing is, can I please do a quick earring shout out? Is that okay? Oh my gosh, sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> is that too much? So these earrings is for whoever's watching, because uh, this will be on YouTube. <laughs> these beautiful doctora earrings, this beautiful doctora made them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you are so talented. Can I just say I love the earrings that I got. I'm probably gonna get myself more. You are so an glad. artist. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that so much. And how can if someone likes the earrings and if they want to get themselves a pair, is there is it okay if we share? Oh, please, yes. That's a uh, Chicana die aretes. It's like Chicana underscore die underscore aretes on Instagram. I'll put it up on on the show notes. Well, thank you, thank you thank once you again. So it's really meaningful much. to have you here. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. I want to thank Dr. Diane Nevarez once again for coming on the podcast. I know that it wasn't easy for her to share everything that she shared. And I'm actually including a, a postscript, a podcast postscript in this episode, just to share a bit more because the conversation between us continued after the recording over email, um, one thing that she told me was that she realized that she never mentioned one key moment that, quote, made me feel really exploited or undervalued as a lecturer. And then she goes on to say, when my TA asked me to sign, approve his contract, and I realized that he was getting paid more than I was that was shocking, end quote. I um, asked her if it was okay for me to share this information as you know, follow up to the episode, so as part of this postscript, and she said, yes, definitely. And, um, and then I shared a little bit more about my own experience of feeling exploited and undervalued, which was when I found out in one of my jobs that I was getting paid close to $30,000 less than my predecessor for doing the exact same job. That for me was a moment of feeling like I had been exploited, like I had been undervalued, um, especially keeping in mind everything that I had put in to do my best, to remain committed, to keep growing, to get, you know, working on my own advancement. Um, that was the moment for me that I realized, I think it's time for, for something else. Um, but um, all of this to say that these situations happen, 
there may be experiences where you find out that you have been undervalued and hopefully it can be the impetus it can be the catalyst for for change for you to fight for change for yourself for you to find fight for change for those that come after you and so with that you know being said we have both remained vulnerable in sharing our experiences and we hope that you find it valuable and that you learn from what we've shared. Thanks so much, everyone. I will talk to you all next time. Thank you so much for joining me in the Grad School Femme Drawing Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or email me your review at gradschoolfemtouring at gmail.com. You can also show your support by going to gradschoolfemtouring.com and joining my mailing list where you'll receive weekly tips, podcast and blog updates, as well as discounts for my digital downloads, online courses, and much more. One last thing, don't forget to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Until next time. 